Okay. I'm going to start with a five minute icebreaker, even though it's already 6.05. We'll just do it anyway. So this icebreaker is called uh, answer in the form of a question. And the answer to each clue is a famous question from history, literature, advertising, or entertainment. So everybody has heard of to be or not to be. It's a famous question. So the answer to all of these are questions. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, I do this kind of stuff. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I forgot something. I forgot to do all the animations. We're getting there though. All right. Should have checked. Okay, as we were saying. Okay. What famous television advertising campaign featured a boy asking a girl and an owl this question about candy? You guys remember this? It's from the 80s. So I might be the only one that remembers. Uh, it's oh, a Tootsie Pop. Yeah. It's a Tootsie Pop, right? Yeah. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll? Tootsie Pop. <laughs> All right. Um, hold on. Tootsie Pop. <laughs> hold on. One second. You gotta do this right. Oh, maybe I did. Okay. Oh, we'll just go with it. <laughs> okay. All right. Disney's Three Little Pigs asked this question just before almost being eaten. Who is it? Um... Here's a hint. No? I don't know this one. Mm -mm. Who's afraid of the big wolf? Oh, okay. Yeah. Big wolf. <laughs> um. Jeez. Okay, next one. This animated live action 1988 movie featured the immortal line, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. Ooh. I'm gonna date myself, but that's that's before oh huh. That's the hint. I know I know it now. I didn't know that was out in eighty eight. <laughs> <laughs> Two framed Roger Rabbit. Right. <laughs> All right. Roger Robert. Okay. So the next one is, in 1984, an elderly spokeswoman for the Wendy's Burger franchise asked this question in television commercial that featured a very large hamburger bun with a minuscule patty inside. No? Mm -hmm. I didn't watch TV in North America in 1984, so I have no idea. <laughs> I wasn't around in 1984. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Where's the oh, beast? yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Abbott and Costello demonstrate poor communication skills in this sports themed comedy routine. Who's on first? Who's on second? Who's on first? I'm first. Who's on second? second. <laughs> All right, you guys should get all this one. This is this last one is not from the 80s. <laughs> all right, named by Rolling Stone magazine as the third most annoying song ever, this 2000 single by Baja Men sought to identify the person who had released the canines. Canines. Yeah, you guys remember that one, right? No. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> who let the dogs out? <laughs> So that, that song's going to be in your head for a while now. Yep. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, it looks like it's going to be just the four of us, which is cool. Um, we're going to do many models today. 
All right. We're getting to the end here. All right. So I'm going to start this by reading a quote from the book. It said, this chapter is somewhat aspirational. If this book is your first introduction to R, this chapter is likely to be a struggle. It requires you to have deeply internalized ideas about modeling, data structures, and iteration. So don't worry if you don't get it. Just put this chapter aside for a few months and come back when you want to stretch your brain. Okay, so with that in mind, we move forward and try to tackle this chapter about many models. So we followed up um, Sandra's last week, Sandra's discussion last week about models. And this one is about uh, implementing multiple models at a time, all right? So there's a few ideas to work with multiple models. One is use many simple models to better understand complex data sets. The second one is to use list columns to store data structures in a data frame. And then third is use the broom package to turn tidy models into tidy data, turn, uh, turn models into tidy data. This second one right here is what we're gonna, is, is really gonna be a, a big focus too, all right? So this all starts with a gap minder data set, if you've seen this one before. Um, there's, it's, there, there's not a lot of columns, it's country and then continent, year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. Okay. And then you can see that there's multiple, um, the country is listed multiple times, the continent is listed multiple times, and then the year, 1952, 1957, 1962, 1967. So it goes from the counts of the years from 1952 to 2007 in increments of five years. Okay. Make sense? All right. So each record is, a, is life expectancy, population, and GDP per year for that country. Okay. All right. So... It says, in this case, we're going to focus on just three variables to answer the question, how does life expectancy change over time for each country? A good place to start is with a plot. So if you were to plot out all the data in the Gapminder data set, it would look like this. Each row, I mean, each line here is a country. And you can see how it adjusts between year and life expectancy. So overall, life expectancy is improving but some countries don't follow this pattern. The overall strong signal of growth makes it harder to see the subtler trends. Okay, Does that makes sense. So everything looks like it's going the same direction, but you can see there's, there's some like this one right here that I'm tracing that might be going in a different direction and it's hard to pick that one out. Okay, So many models and list columns are a way to solve that. All right, so one way to study each country would be by filtering for each country. So if we do like a, um, like a, a filter on this just for New Zealand, we can see what the actual data is. So that's the line for New Zealand. It's in here somewhere. Um, this is, the, this is a, a residual. This is the line for Canada. It's in there somewhere. And then another residual. Um, graph. And then this is the one for Brazil. It's also in there somewhere and then a corresponding graph there, right? So, so that's one way to look at it country by country is just by filtering, okay? But a better, a better way would be with PER. So this problem is structured a little differently to what you've seen before. Instead of repeating an action for each variable, we want to repeat an action for each country, a subset of rows. To do that, we need a new data structure, which is the nested data frame. Okay, so we'll remember that if there's a if there's a tibble or a data frame of some kind, per typically iterates over the columns that you specify, right? It might be the, the mean of life expectancy and then the mean of population and the mean of this or whatever it might be, it goes from column to column. But for this study, we want to track everything that's in this group for Afghanistan and then everything that's in this group for Albania and then so on. So we're actually trying to iterate this direction rather than this direction. And so we, can, um, we need to have this new nested data frame structure, okay? You guys already seen and worked with nested data frames? No. All right. Okay. So if we if we do this and we create a new um, a new object called by underscore country, we take the gap minder data set 
group by the country and the continent and then use the word, the command nest, what it does is it gives you one line for each group that you create, Afghanistan, Albania, and so on. And then the remaining columns that you didn't include in the group all go into this column itself. Okay. So if you were to do a view on this, you can see each line, Afghanistan, Albania, and then there's this column here called data, which if you click on that, it's, it's that data that corresponds with, with that country. And if you clicked on the next one, it would be slightly different, corresponding to Albania and so on down, okay? So it, it's like, um, it's just like a, well, it's nested, and I guess that's why they call it nest, but it's, it's nesting a, a data frame inside of a data frame, inside of a column of a data frame. But it helps because you know that all of this data right here only pertains to, to the row that you're working on. Cool so far, any questions? All right, so a couple of comments that I put out here. One, it helps to be fluent with the group by command. I don't know if you guys have worked with the group by or have, have some experience with it. I only put that in because a couple of weeks ago, I, was, I, I spent like an hour and a half just trying to figure out how group buys work because I was confused by them and like making sure that the order that you put the group buys in and what happens when you summarize afterwards and, um, and what does it do to the outcome data. So if you get a chance to just play around with group by, it can be helpful to be more fluent with that command. Um, and then the other thing to notice is that the new column is called data. Okay. And then we also notice that it is a list and we can iterate over that with per. Okay. So, so this column of data is actually a list. Okay. So um, that's important to remember as well. Okay. All right. So now that we have the elements that we want to iterate over, which is each country's data frame, we define the model function. Okay. So in this, in this case, it's just going to be a linear model between life expectancy and year. And then the data is the data frame. Okay? So this is just the model. It's just a life expectancy uh, or it's just a linear model for those. Okay? Then we use the per map to apply the function to each element of the list. Okay? So we create a new object called models. And then this would be the approach by country data. And then you apply this function, this model to it. Except that this would leave each of the models as a free floating object. You would have one data set that's the data, and then you would have a different object models that holds all of the, the model information. So instead of doing it that way, um, it's better to store the model results as a column in the by country data frame. So in other words, instead of creating a new object in the global environment, we're going to create a new variable in the by country data frame. And that's a job for mutate. Okay. Follow even, even if it's a variable, it's a list. Even though it's a variable at what? It's a list. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the difference here is that this one creates a new object models. This one just pipes the action into by country or it, well, it, I guess it, it recreates by country. You can see here it pipes by country, mutate. We have a new column called model and it's a map of the data to the, to the country model function that we created up here. Okay. All right. And so then that gives us this output. It's the, it's everything rolled up. It's the, still the nested data frame with the country and the continent as we had it before. Here's the data. That's a data frame inside of this column. And now we've added the model on top of that right next to it. Okay. So within this column is all the model information for Afghanistan, Albania, and so on. 
Okay, so far so good. All right, we can even go a step further and add a plot for each country's data, okay? So in addition to what we had before where we added this model, now I'm plotting by country, mutate, plots, map, data, and then this ggplot creates the, creates the plot, okay? And the outcome there is uh, the data, year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita are in here. The model results, coefficients, and residuals are in here. And then the plot for each country is in here. Okay. All right. And it says this has a big advantage because all the related objects are stored together. You don't need to manually keep them in sync when you filter or arrange. If your list of data frames and list of models were separate objects, you'd have to remember that whenever you reorder or subset one vector, you need to reorder or subset all the others in order to keep them in sync. If you forgot, your code will continue to work, but it will give the wrong answer. Okay. So does that make sense? It keeps it all together? Mm -hmm. It's helpful? Yeah. All right, good. Okay. Any questions so far? If not, there's a practice. So, so uh, Sandra, you had mentioned that you hadn't seen these before. I hadn't seen them before either. Colin or Sky, have you guys ever worked with these before? I read this, I read about this in a book. Hmm. Um, I've worked with, <clears throat> I've worked with nested data, it used to be called, well, how I referred to it in the past was hierarchical data, oh. but it was just nested data. But the concept of like rolling it up, like rolling it up to like be its like own object within the data is something that was like, this is pretty radical. <laughs> but then taking it, a, taking it a step further was like, but wait, you could add all the model output to that same thing. And then when you just shared the ggplot, I didn't think about the ggplot one, but you could store all that ggplot data in each row. So I, I, I haven't seen like doing it this way, but I've seen it like I've seen hierarchical data before, but like this is just a, I don't want to say it's radical, but it's just kind of yeah. eye opening that you can do it. Yeah. Well, I, I, no, I think what I like, I like the way it show up. It's just because sometimes when I do this, some work, I have list of list of list. So I use a lot of list, but at least in this way, we can see the visual representation in once. So it, maybe it's more clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, had to, I had to relearn the idea that you could only keep like one, one value inside of these columns, you know, and, and start to think about it as keeping a whole entire set of, of data, a list in each of these. So that's what, that's what changed for me. Mm -hmm. hmm. But the only issue is I think that it's not possible to have, um, if we wanted to have the global model, we need to do something separately. It's not possible in group by, it's not so, it's possible to do by group and on total. Um, by group and then a total. Do you mean a total for each group? Yes. Now, if if we wanted to get the the first plot that you show us, we can't use this way because uh, now that is split by group, it's not possible to see the overview. Oh right, right, right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, do it. Well, well, couldn't you? Couldn't you? I mean. If you just want like the global model added to this whole thing, like could you just do a mutate and add a column and then add that model object to it? If yeah. I'm if I'm understanding the what we were talking about. Yeah. So uh, no, I don't know, but some you know sometimes you are also interested in the overview. But anyway, we can do the overview separately. But yes, when you group by, we just have by level. We can't have the overview as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you'd have to do. You'd have to go back and filter out just the ones that you wanted to look at, possibly. Mm -hmm. so. um, okay. 
Well, good. If there's no other questions, then I'm going to leave it to you guys. Why don't you uh, give it a go here on, on this, uh, this practice? So, um, so the practice is to break the MT cars data set into three groups, one for each value of the cylinder column, and then generate a box plot for the MPG column of each group. And I finally got this one after a while, but I needed help thinking through the per part. Okay. So the code isn't actually very long on this, but um, I'm gonna give you guys a chance to work on it and we can, we can talk through it together. I'm trying to think what might be the most helpful to see. Um, let, me, let me maybe start with this. I'll start with this view here and then, um, because this, this might get you through the first step. All right, you guys can give it a try. Don't forget to load the tidyverse. So maybe we'll stop after the first the first step here and see who who gets the uh, who got the nested data frame to work. Yeah. Sandra got it. No, no, I just said I'm fighting against my computer. Works. Okay. <laughs> uh. Oh, I, you got think... it? I mean, uh, Sky, you got it? Yeah, I just follow the same method that you showed in the screen. Yeah, that's all yeah. you got to do. Oh, so I uh, can, in do, can I share like my yeah. screen? Huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how I can share my screen. Is there a little button that says? Oh, so there's something on the board and then I just click this and then share. So yeah. what I did is, uh, you know, see on this, uh, on the console, I write the uh, CYL data. Uh -huh. And then I follow the same method that you use. It says uh, uh, MT cars and then it is grouped by the CYL. So uh -huh. because it's grouped by the CYL, so it will be separate into six, four, eight group. After that, I do a nest data for the rest of the data. So it come out and uh, it come out to be like this, six, four, eight, and then, then each, the rest of the data is a tuple. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I just follow what you... Uh, that's exactly right. Okay. Colin, Sandra, good on that step? Yes. Cool, all right. So then the next, um, the next part of it was to, you guys can, can see can see the, the screen uh, the PowerPoint right all right so so then um, the next step is to generate a box plot for the MPG column of each group. A box plot. Okay. When I go on my when I get the person calls, I will go to do my phone interview. And uh, then before he call, I will, I'm going to just uh, try to do it. Is, is the interview to right like soon? Is it today? Yeah, it's 4.30. But, oh, okay. but they haven't called me yet, so I will just... Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay, I think here I'm going to just do a mutate. Mutate and then map. Map for each of the data set. Um, it's a box plot. Box plot of what? 
Let me see if this will be a good, if this might be a good hint for you. Yeah, not in the screen. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I get the right one. I think this would probably be the best one. Dun, dun, dun. Success. Um, finally, the data is either map data, and at all we have data again. X. Okay, this part is a bit confusing. Yeah. What well, what part is confusing? Is the fact that we have data twice. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because this, this the first one I got because it's data the colon of by country. Right. Uh, and this one is okay. Is because it's when we say a function. Okay, now this one is a bit more confusing. Okay. Yeah, this data references the the column in the in the data set. This data is one of the arguments for ggplot. But yeah, they're both called the same thing. Uh, yes, because they are, they are called the same, but they are not the same. So it's what is confusing. Yeah. Title. So in this case, the title is. Uh, uh, in this case, the title is. Uh, what? C Y L? Yes. It doesn't work. Something happened. Let me see what happened. How long did you get it? I think I have. Oh, I have it. Um, I was just trying. Yeah, I think I have it. Okay, let me see. Let me just title. We want to be copyright. I think I have it. Yeah, I think I have it. Yeah. Now that I look at it. One. Six. I got it. Sky, how's it coming? Uh, this is, there's a problem. There's an error in my code. So I need to figure out what happened to it. Do you want to share and we can look at it together? Oh, okay. So share screen. Okay, this, so that's the that's my screen. Uh -huh. So that's my code. I put so after the next, I put another uh, give the data. I send the data to mutate. Uh -huh. I follow. I actually just follow what what you ha have in the screen. It says plots is equal to map data. Data is the data in uh, no, in the data in the table, and then group ggplot data is equal to dot x, which is this data is it means like each of the tuple. But the, um, are, are you sure that you didn't put a minus instead of the tilde for before the ggplot? It looked like a minus sign, I, not a tilde. The sign? You know, the oh, before the ggplot here. In front of the ggplot, uh -huh. you think I should put it? You put the, the wave. The tilde, yeah. The delta. The, yeah, is that a, a minus sign or is it a tilde? Is it delta? Hmm. So you you think I should put something else in the delta? Um. I think maybe some one of the. 
And it might be one of your, um, it might be one of your parentheses too. Oh, Sorry. parentheses, huh? It you might know, be. Go ahead. It, it might also be that you're you're assigning, you're assigning it to an object, to. Or would that matter? No, I guess that no, that's probably fine. Um, so empty cars group by. by Cylinder, yeah, nest, yeah, mutate plot equals map data ggplot data dot x. Um, I think you need another parentheses after the mpg. Oh, after the mpg, so it's here. Yeah. Yeah. So do I need uh, another parenthesis at the end? No, I think what well, I it would just. Oh, it works. Oh, you're right. Oh, now it works. Plot. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're right. The, the parenthesis. Too many parentheses, and I was. Okay. Okay. So you, so that's how you. There, you, there, you get it. Um, now, how to how to see it um, in the console. Um, I think maybe if you wanted to see it, you could do view, maybe cylinder underscore data. Yeah. Make plot? No. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe you have to do it like that. Yeah, so... Uh, you're close. I mean, I, I don't think you need the view, but you can use subsetting. You can do the dollar sign subsetting, but then you got to remember you got to go another level. And so oh. you would take the first element. So okay. you're close. So it's the double bracket. Double bracket. So that would just be bracket, bracket underneath the curly braces. Wait, I, I don't get it. How? Oh, see how they're what they're labeled one, two, three. So what we're doing is we're using that that dollar sign to say, take out the plots object, subset the plots object. But then we have three, um, three objects in there. So it would be one would pull the first one, second one, third one. Oh, I see. I got you. You seeing? I need to use the this right? Well, you would still do the dollar sign for the plots. So you can do the dollar sign for the plots. And then over, you would do the brackets. Oh, like this. Yep. And then you would put one, would take the first element, oh. second element, third element. Oh, I see. I got you. Two, right? Yep. And then three. three. Is that what you were looking to do, Ryan? That's it. Yeah. Looks like everybody got it. Okay. Very nicely done. That's how it goes. Wow. Oh, so, they're not calling me. So hopefully you can find some application for this. Okay. Are you taking off, Sky? No, it's just, they're not calling me yet. Not sure why. <laughs> oh, it's coming. Okay, I have to go now. Okay. Wait, no, it's no, no, no. It's, they're not calling me yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so hopefully you can find some application for that. Um, I I actually did today, as a matter of fact, um, found some application for it. And I'm thinking of, of sharing, um, except it's, it's customer data, so I probably can't, but let me see if I can. Let me, I'm sorry, let me just. Yeah. Let me see if I can, if there's anything here I can share. Anyway, um, I, was, I was kind of amazed because um, it, it just so happened that I was trying to take some action on on a, on a, a larger data set, but I wanted to do certain things within just groupings of it. Um, and so so it worked out pretty well. Let me see if I can share this. Um, If you can't show it, Ryan, that's cool. Especially because it's, uh, don't forget, it's on YouTube. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they're recording it, so. Yeah, so exactly. So, yes, because 
Yes, be cautious because we have every year we have a training about that. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, hopefully you guys find some application for that. Um, I was happy to, that it worked out for me okay. Um, yeah, I found, um, and this might be for saying or for Sandra too, is I was, I played around with it because I was thinking like, okay, can I apply this to my own data? And when it came to like demographics, like age groups, and so I was thinking about, like, could I find a way, like, can I make a model with some variables and see if that model is the same relationship across age groups or income level or something. And so it was nice to kind of nest it by those specific demographic variables and then run, like, just a, a simple linear model on two variables. And it it was pretty slick. I was like, this is this works pretty well. So Very nice. Okay. Well, that's what I had for us today, some exposure to that. There was also some discussion about the, uh, the broom package, but I didn't know that it, I didn't think that it was super necessary. The broom package is really just a way of taking um, uh, like model results and putting them into a tidy mm -hmm. format. So I think, I think if you get to the point where you're really using models, especially linear models, then the broom package will come in handy, but. Um, just for exposure to it, not as much. So, um, so anyway, any other questions or, or anything? Okay. So um, this is what I've got for the next couple of weeks. Then um, we did many models today, and then we've got um, next week will be our markdown. And I asked Sky if she wanted to handle those, um, the, these chapters, and she said she'd be up for it. So I was going to double check with her, but I think she's occupied now. Uh, and then Colin, you're going to do graphics for communication? Yeah, I can, cool. I can do the graphics for communication part. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll be good. And we'll have our, our well-deserved break at that point.